Dear friends and colleagues, welcome to uh, ESC TV here live in Barcelona at the European Society of Cardiology meeting. It's great to be back live, isn't it, Carolyn? Absolutely. And I brought you with you today the awardee. You almost to look too young for an awardee, uh, Carolyn. The awardee of the Rene Lenek Lecture, which is the Master Clinician Award of the ESC for Clinical Cardiology. And you remember, Rene Lenek was the father of auscultation because he invented the stethoscope, the skilled musician he was, and crafted, handcrafted his flutes, developed the stethoscope, and uh, was the, what we would call these days probably a translational clinical scientist. <laughs> That's a good, good. So welcome, Caroline. Uh, how does a superstar in heart failure become a superstar in heart failure uh, in, uh, s at such a young age, Caroline? Frank, first, thank you. Thank you so much for your generous comments. And honestly, the stardom is only because I know superstars and stand on the shoulders of giants. And I mean that very sincerely, the mentors and people I've learned from. Um, this may sound simplistic, but it's really the truth. It's by going with your heart. Uh, no pun intended, but when I first got interested in what was then called diastolic heart failure, I was quite dissuaded from pursuing that um, because at that time, people didn't even believe the syndrome existed. That's how old I am, by the way. So more than 20 years ago, people were still not very sure if this form of heart failure existed and heart failure was synonymous with systolic heart failure, right? So I think the lesson is if you're sort of interested, even if you're a geek and nobody else kind of thinks this is going to be a big thing and you know, there are more glitzy things to do, in, that, in those days everyone was trying to be an interventional cardiologist, right? Like, like you. Everyone was trying to be like you. But in the end, um, I, I pursued and just drove according to my interest. But that's a career advice we give our young folks, don't we? It's exactly what we do. Don't try to catch the wave that's already gone. Get prepared. Get skilled. And then wait for the wave. Catch it, augment it, and surf it. What that's it. it. But you have to be skilled. But Tell us a little bit about you, Carolyn. Carolyn, uh, you are, just that I get that right, what, what are you are? You're the director of the first Asian women's heart clinic in Singapore. You're the professor of the Duke, uh, the Singapore Heart Center. Uh, you're the professor there in, in, in clinical science and at the Duke University there in Singapore. Uh, you run various clinical trial programs, translational science programs, uh, and how, what a good match for the Rainer Lennick Award, the uh, uh, clinical scientist, what we would call these days, who invented the stethoscope. She's also uh, spearheading really huge efforts to uh, uh, marry up the artificial, intelli uh, artificial intelligence with ECHO, the modern stethoscope. How do you do all of that, Carol? Oh, thank you. It sounds very schizophrenic, uh, but first of all, it's it's truly, I think, divine intervention, and I'm very, very grateful for the opportunities. But it is important for all of us to recognize the opportunity uh, when you see it, and also to be focused. So all of it does, does make sense if you understand that I am a clinician, and so I practice as a cardiologist seeing heart failure patients. And then because the kind of heart failure I'm interested in really predominantly affects women, I just feel we needed a women's heart clinic, so that was in line with that clinical focus and passion. And then on the research end, that's why the professorship, that's why the PhD, and you know, looking and studying and trying to understand better heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And then now that we've reached a point where we have finally positive trials in HEFPEF, we need to make the diagnosis earlier and to identify the right patients for the right treatment at the right time when they can still be treated. And so recognizing that many of these patients are being seen by generalists and um, in the community who don't have access to ECHO, 
it was really a, a sort of a logical extension that based on all the data that I had accumulated over the decades to use it for machine learning to automate some of the things we do. So it's, it, it was a flow um, and if you had asked me at the beginning, would I know I'd get here? No. And so I am very, very grateful. Um, it is hard work and it is also choosing what not to do. Isn't that focus? It's not just choosing what to do, but what not to do while we pursue what we do do. You know, if you all recall, we've been here back <clears throat> to Barcelona now for how many times in the last 20 years? 20 years ago, heart failure was a niche. It was not center stage. Yes. We've seen the rise of heart failure over the decade now. It moved at the Heart Failure Congress here in Spain, in Seville, I picked the motto, Heart Failure is moving center stage. It was a bit cheeky, but it was the way it is. We've seen it. We were Cinderella. Yes. And now we are center stage. And, you know, with the rise of Heart Failure, we saw your rise as well, Caroline. Frank, I'm going to be even cheekier. I want to say, your leadership, you made Heart Failure sexy again. <laughs> It's true. I, I, it just like I'm we, not yeah, we used to, to be like the that ugly one. child, you know, that, that no. uh, but we comes have six, after the interventional trials. But hey, but, <laughs> but we have 60 million people uh, with heart failure worldwide. Half of them are half PEF. Ten years ago, many of us in the clinic didn't even write a report card with half PEF on it. Now we have really deeper phenotype that and learn so much even at this Congress today. Yes. And you are part of that. We will have an outcome trial presented and uh, it's kind, kind of coming full circle. Tell us about that story, Carly. Oh, it, it's, it's just what I've been praying that would happen in our career because please don't forget we've had many misses as well. So when we first started out in the treatment of HEF-PEF, we went with neurohormonal blockade, things that we were familiar with with HEF-REF. Had neutral trial after neutral trial. Then we tried to go after a mechanism that we thought was unique, the nitric oxide, soluble guanylate cyclase, cyclic GMP axis. We tried many ways to augment that and unfortunately had neutral trials. But we kept learning about the disease along the way. For example, learning that there is a difference between a ejection fraction that is not quite normal and one that is much higher, learning that there are different types and treatable mimickers, if I may. I mean, look at us now. We're now all about picking out amyloidosis, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, other differential diagnoses, if I may, that have specific benefits. And then we started to open up our thinking a bit and, and saying, okay, this may more be a systemic manifestation. There might be microvascular involvement, not just of the heart, the kidneys, the skeletal muscles. Although I have to admit, our stumbling upon the SGLT2 inhibitors with the first robustly positive outcomes trial in Emperor Preserved last year, um, that, that was serendipitous because the drugs were, you know, initially used for diabetes, right? And then we noticed, wait a minute, it seems to be preventing heart failure. And we were like, I think a lot of that heart failure must be half pef but of course nobody characterized, so we don't know. And then look at us now. We're, it's, 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 we're, we're going to hear about a, yet another outcomes trial with it, so. Let's get back to that a yeah. little bit, the classification. That's evolved, you know. Perfectly frank, 10, 15 years ago, we didn't talk about PEF. We didn't understand it, still don't know what half PEF is really, I have to say. But, so we have half ref ejection below 40. Then we, at Everything the guidelines else. in 2016, took the uh, decision to call it half MREF. You had already proposed with your paper with Scott Solomon, there is a middle child. We at the time thought, well, should we name it HEF-MEF, that middle child, that range of 40 to 50? Yeah. And just to make clear that we didn't have data, we want to ignite uh, uh, science in that. And then north of 50 is the PEF, and this is where we are. Can you tell us a little bit? Oh, I would love to because I want to salute the 2016 ESC guideline writers. I mean, I know it's led by 
Piotr Ponikowski, Adrian Vors, but I know you played a big part as well. You got a lot of flack, actually, for naming that section. I, I still remember when it came out, everyone was saying, are you saying it's a totally different thing? No, the only thing was to give it a name so that we could address the evidence gap. Bill, Becca, and it happened. Bill, Becca called us uh, MREF. That is a, a definition a psychiatrist yes, would love. Yes, exactly. <laughs> but we were right because we said, Listen, we want to have clarity. We don't have data in 40 to 50, and now Emperor Preserved is a trial in mildly reduced and, NPATH, yep. and so is Deliver, yep. mildly reduced NPATH. So signed, sealed. Yeah, deliver. so you were right, but I, I want everyone to remember it wasn't easy when you first did that, well, but it achieved its aim. Now we look back and it achieved its aim. Now so we, we have data now, there. Now we have data f for patients with half Yeah. And this is, you're the queen of half -path. and half of uh, the world's population with heart failure, the 60 million, do have that disease. And now we have a treatment. So how are we taking it on from here? What should our recommendations worldwide be, what should we do in clinical practice, and where's the future? Yeah, that, that's a very good question, and I can only share what I, I think. I, I do want to point out, though, that it's nice to be here where not just the European guidelines, but the American guidelines, the universal definition, have all employed this mildly reduced and preserved. And if you look at the American guidelines that came out after our ESC uh, heart failure guidelines, you can already glimpse where it's going, where we now have recommendations for the, the mildly reduced, we're getting recommendations for the preserved, and of course the whole question now is, first, are there medications that are going to work across the ejection fraction spectrum? Do we need to classify patients by ejection fraction in the first place? By the way, I'm debating Professor Fayez and that. <laughs> tomorrow about this but in essence I do believe that ejection fraction has been useful and is still importantly importantly applicable in our current clinical practice because we have decades of evidence that has been built on that in the HEFREF space. Are we able to now treat some patients across the entire ejection fraction spectrum range, as long as we know it's heart failure, we actually do with some diuretics, cardiac rehab. I mean, we actually do with some. So why not consider there may be some medications, but we'll have to wait for the deliver results. In the future, I, I wonder if our nomenclature will continue to change. If I could please appeal, I, I really think it's time to consider sex-specific cutoffs because we know that the ejection fraction, what's considered normal for a woman, is, a, is slightly higher than for a man at a given age. So maybe it's time that we can start embracing it without overcomplicating, because the key thing is to get the right drug to the right patients. Um, I, I do think that we will continue testing more therapies that are not only focused on the heart, not only medical, but devices and even systemic um, it, uh, Things like splanchnic denervation, very clever uh, uh, um, techniques. Um, and I do think it now behooves us to, to implement some of the results that we have. Um, the guidelines may be updated. We'll see. I'm not sure. But we already have quite robust data that we should be at least trying to identify these patients, many of whom don't reach cardiologists. So we need to be trying to see and find these patients. So 30 million people worldwide with HEFPEF. We now have a treatment. Certainly we do. We know that deliver is positive. The more the details we'll see today. So we keep them out of hospitals. That we, what we certainly know. I think ejection fraction is helpful to identify the patient at risk, but we should look at the whole patient. It's much more. We should deeper phenotype. You mentioned amyloid. I'm interested in sarcoid. Yeah. in AIVC, all of that. We, we need to know how we, in the future, heart failure is not one disease, it's hundreds of diseases, it's a clinical syndrome. We have to deeper phenotype. For me, that is the future. Some final last words for, from your side. How 
what should we expect in the HEFPEF world as well? Will we actually keep the word HEFPEF? That's a good question now. I, I'm going to wait for, you know, bigger bodies than me, like guideline writers and so on, to see what the consensus is. But regardless of the name, I think we're really at a very, very magical point in the history of heart failure. In a sense, it's a story of how far we've come. In a sense, it's actually the beginning of the story, don't you think? And, you know, Frank, you've been very, very gracious in asking me, but I really want to thank you and many of the Goyans, really, truly, uh, of the heart failure world for bringing us this far. You know, we, we keep standing on the shoulders we, of we, giants. We, we did it together. But the, the key thing is, in the future, I think we have made a start. We will deepen the phenotype heart failure, go more for specific uh, therapies. But everybody should realize this is historic. We have finally a treatment now with SGLT2s in patients yeah. with HEFPEF, something you had proposed 20 years ago for many, this disease didn't even exist. And now we can make the life of our patients better, keep them out of hospital, and probably when we have bigger trials, longer follow-up, even save lives. Yeah. And that is your story. You know, full circle from basic science, truly, into clinical medicine, that is cross-fertilization at its finest. And what could be more uh, uh, worthy for an rainy lecture award than someone who brings a disease that for we didn't have a treatment for, yeah, well, for up till now, for 30 million people, and bring it from basic science to some hard work, commitment to Finally, a treatment. Teamwork. Teamwork. Thank you. Some so final much. words from you. Just thank you. And it's truly, it's not about me. Just It's really a, about the so many investigators and principal investigators and colleagues. I mean that sincerely, but I'm so grateful to the ESC for this honor. Thank you. And before you forget, next year's spotlight of the ESC will be what? Heart, Heart failure. failure. <laughs> so we have delivered. Heart failure has finally come center stage in cardiology. Hey. With interventional, with EP, we are brothers in arms, brothers in mind, we work together. But the future is now, and I think there's the best Brilliant. yet to come. Thank you so much.